think what prepared me for that job was working in a pub <laughs> because you get to <laughs> you grew up in a pub I worked in a pub and you just get to read people it's about people managing you how many times I've interviewed people and and like they'll <laughs> like you know some some very experienced people and they'll make a disparaging comment about a show that I've produced. It's really important yeah. to listen to the person who you're auditioning to or interviewing with because there are people who can listen and take notes and adapt and that's that is mm -hmm. you know you need to do that don't you in all walks of life. Today's guest is Faye Dawn the BAFTA winning executive producer of the Apple TV drama Bad Sisters. Faye and I actually went to secondary school together and it's been amazing to follow her journey in the TV industry from afar. Starting off as a receptionist at a production company, she's risen through the ranks and has built a reputation as someone who writers and directors love to work with. Faye's experience of building high performing teams and pitching things into existence is so relevant, whatever industry you work in. So I'm really excited to have her on the show. If you enjoy what you hear, please like and subscribe. It would mean the world to me and will help this podcast reach as many people as possible. You don't want to miss this. Enjoy. Faye, welcome to the show. Um, my first question for you, uh, in life, what's the most important thing that you've ever had to pitch for? That's a good question. Um... Probably when I had my first baby, I took um, a year off. And then when I was going back into the workplace, I was a freelancer. And I genuinely thought, am I going to get hired again? Because I'm a young woman with a small child and I'd been out of the industry for a year. So I had a job interview and I was so nervous that I think I probably came across as really cocky. Um, but that was <laughs> that job and that I was able to do that because it was it was a promotion. It was a big job. Um, and and I didn't think that I'd get it, but I really wanted it because um, it, it, it was based in London. It meant that I could stay at home and oversee a show from <laughs> London. Um, so that was probably... Yes, and that kind of then set me in really good stead for the rest of my exec producing career because that was my first sort of big series um, exec producer job. So I would Interesting. say that. Interesting. So that that became a bit of a turning point, presumably, in yes. in, in terms of allowing allowing you to take the the next steps. Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to delve into that that kind of idea of being you know, female in a, in a very male dominated industry a little bit later on. So we'll, we'll kind of come back to that thread. Um, so if, if, if pitching for that job was the, the kind of, um, you know, the big one, it, yes. what's the one that's got away? If you, if you think about all of the things that, that, you know, maybe the, you know, shows that you've tried to pitch or things that yeah. you've tried to be a part of, is there one that you think, Oh, I wish, I wish we made that, or I wish I got to work on that. All the time. <laughs> I am, um, I try, <laughs> um, I, I really wanted a podcast recently. Um, I tried to get the rights to it um, and I met the producers and I thought the meeting went really well. Um, and then I wrote a creative pitch for it and put, and, and put in a financial offer and, um, and we lost out to somebody else and and that happens that we don't we're not always everybody's first choice and that hurts because you just you're passionate about stuff and want um yeah I wanted I wanted that podcast but there are others that we did have, win. You, have you got a, of course have you got a process for sort of bouncing back for those sorts of things because I think you know what whatever you do in life whether you know you're working in the tv industry or you're you know trying to get your next job those those kind of setbacks sometimes hurt so how how do you get back on the horse in those sorts of situations I think honestly after 20 plus years in the industry you just have to you have to have a really thick skin and not take it personally because um yeah. 
because otherwise you just wouldn't be able to do the job um, because it is there's there are a lot of setbacks and I think what you have to do is just really celebrate the wins um, and and just keep thinking forwards and thinking okay on to the next thing and being kind of um, yeah agile I would say <laughs> yeah not yeah. wallow it is yeah, hard absolutely. but it but <laughs> with experience you just get used to it yeah yeah um so i mean you are now a a bafta winning uh, tv producer but we went to school together um we were teenagers back in a a small market town in oxfordshire um that's that's quite a journey so take us back to the beginning like what's what's your story when when you were at school did you did you have this dream of being um in show business I was always ambitious and I always wanted to leave Wallingford and and sort of travel and and go to London and go to university. I was the first person in my family to go to university, but I was always quite driven, self-driven. My parents, both working class, but always, you know, wanted the best for me, but were never parents that were saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, so I was always quite self-driven, um, and no, I didn't know that I wanted to be in show business. Um, I knew that I liked stories. Um, I loved reading and I can't write, but I, I can't write dialogue, but I, but I can write story and I, I had Mm. (laughs) imagination. So, um, when I went to university, I um I was lucky that a writer a very famous writer um was a regular in my mum's pub um and uh-huh. and he and he wrote for television and and I just didn't think that that was a world that was accessible to me at all um and he was wonderful because he he showed me films and tv programs that he'd written talked to me about the industry and I just at that point, I was kind of working behind the bar um, around 18, 19. And I just thought, yeah, this is that's what I want to do. So it was thanks to him, really, that I um, that I kind of, that I sort of saw a way in for myself. Um, and then yeah. I interviewed as a receptionist at a, a very small production company um, called Company Pictures, which was run by George Faber and Charlie Pattinson, who were absolute titans and still are. Um, and I was just very lucky to to fall into the right place for for me, really, because I was able to sort of grow there. They were they were great. So did you did you go to uni? Did you did you study yeah. anything kind of related, English or film or anything like that? Yeah. I did media and um media studies um at Sussex University and I was one of those people who was I I was quite I was quite academic and I remember feeling quite disappointed that we didn't have enough lectures and it was and um (laughs) (laughs) and then people can be a bit snobby (laughs) can't they and I think I was one of them (laughs) during the course um but I just loved being in Brighton and that was kind of such a creative place. It was a really good place to be. Um, and the course was, the course was fine. It was, um, it, it was, it was fine, but um, I don't think to, to get into the industry, I don't think it's necessary to do a degree in, I think you just need to work and just get in there and kind mm. of, yeah, find out what it is in the industry that you're interested in and that you want to because there's so so many um avenues to go um and I knew that I was interested in scripts so I wrote a I wrote a film when I was at uni a short film which which my tutor um directed and we produced and I just loved it and then that was it I had the bug (laughs) you were hooked It's interesting you say that you you know to get into the the production side of the industry you don't you don't need that background necessarily I always felt as an actor that going to drama school was like 
a shop window it was like it, it was accelerating your visibility within the industry because if you had that sort of showcase at the end if you were at one of the you know bigger drama schools then agents mm -hmm. came to see you casting directors came to see you and it kind of gave you that that leg up but for with so with company you started off in uh, at, you know at reception um i mean that might have that must have been like amazing because it, it, to a certain extent, you get to see everything that's going on. You get to see everyone that's coming through the door. You're kind of like hearing all of the buzz. Yeah. It was amazing. At the time when I first joined Company Pictures, they were producing, I think, the second series of Shameless, um, which is still to right. this day one of the best shows I think ever made. Um, and so I read... <laughs> I don't know if I was allowed to, but as soon as scripts came in <laughs> and I was asked to print them, <laughs> them <before. laughs> so I read these, that, this was back in the days when everything was printed. Um, I would just read yeah. everything that came in um, and gave my opinion whether people wanted to hear it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, and there were amazing producers there at the time. Um, Matt Jones, Tom Greaves, Suzanne Harrison, um, Willow Grills and I just Robin Slovo yeah all all fantastic people and all with very different tastes and and so I just read everything that they were developing and it just I just absorbed as much as I could really um just made myself and um yeah this, which is why I feel really sorry for people now with with post-covid the only reason why mm. I in my career was because I was there in an office around all of these people listening to their conversations seeing which writers they were meeting what seeing casting tapes yeah. come in reading scripts and it was just an amazing training ground um and I think with people working at home a bit more it's I feel sorry I'm um, sorry for the people now sort of coming up it must be harder yeah much much, so much more difficult to have that visibility I suppose yeah yeah, it is. You, it's that um, you, I'm here. Hmm. Yeah. So you, you accelerated your kind of career through company pictures relatively quickly. Talk us through that, that journey where you went from reception to what, like script assistant. What, what was the next step? So, well, I went from, yes. So I was the receptionist and then I was a development assistant um, so I would just yeah. look at all the scripts coming in, sort of um, um, a reader, really, for, for the produ development producers. And then I'd recommend what the producers and execs sort of read, um, things that okay. came in from agents, ex scripts. Um, and then I was a script editor, um, no, assistant script editor, then a script editor, then an assistant producer, then a producer, then an executive producer. Yeah, so I kind of went up many rounds. <laughs> now that the word kind of producer to people mm -hmm. that aren't in the industry is it is a kind of bit vague. So can you know, you see it on the credits, and there's always like, you know, several different people doing that role. So what what is a producer? What's the what's the day to day um, that that, you know, you are um, going through in order to make shows happen? So the producer in television, the producer, when I was a producer, you were the, responsible for um, delivering the show on budget. So, and you were sort of the head of the HODs. So you were responsible for hiring the, the um, directors, the costume design, production design, um, those heads of department. Um, and then you work very closely with a line producer, who's the person who really runs the money. Um, and because I came from an editorial background, I would be very much on set by the monitor, watching the filming, good relationship with the director and the writers, making sure that the writer's vision was delivered to screen and then working closely with the line producer to make sure that we weren't the creative decisions we were making to deliver that script weren't going to take us over budget. Um, so really, yes, you're the person on set who is the in charge. 
Um, yeah. It's and, and in, oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say in in that kind of role because I'm sure the exec producer's slightly slightly different hat, but in that producer role, mm -hmm. you you are you know responsible for bringing together a high performing team in mm -hmm. a very short period of time. So, you know, I spend a lot of time working with people in, in the business world and, and people can work together for six, seven, eight years. When you're creating a, a show, you might be, you know, bringing people together for a four or five month period. And within that time, they, they've got to work at their absolute best under really quite difficult conditions. So like what prepared you to, to be in that leadership role? And, you know, what, what kind of skills did you learn, um, as part of, as part of that job? I think what prepared me for that job was working in a pub <laughs> because you get to <laughs> you grew up in a pub, I worked in a pub and you just get to read people. It's about people management. You need to be a people person. It's exactly like you say, you need to put the right people together. So you could have the best director in the world, yeah. or the best DP in the world, but they, you need to know what, what that direct, that, because everybody's different. Everybody's nuance. Everybody has different skill sets. So it's what what does that person need and what um and what does the show need? Um and it's alchemy, really. And sometimes it works and, and sometimes it doesn't work as well. <laughs> um but um but yeah, I think I think working in the pub, being a people person, talking to people, listening to people and and um yeah, I think that was a good training ground for me. Interesting. Um, <laughs> you you mentioned earlier that you that you can't write dialogue. Um, I'm sure that's not true for a start. But um, <laughs> but in in terms of the in terms of the kind of producer's role in you know, working with the writer, I know you're known in the industry for someone that has very strong relationships with the with the writers that you work with, and that you know people love working with you in that way. Um, like what, what, what's your role there as a sort of sounding board and a, 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 a supporter of that creative person, you know, who's delivering the script? I think, I think really the, the key word is to enable. So, um, it's to, it's to be somebody that the writer trusts, first of all, so they trust your instincts and your tastes. So that's why we're working together in the first yeah. place. Um, and it's really to listen to them and what they want to deliver. And some, and sometimes during the process, all writers are different, of course, and we all have our um, foibles, but, you know, often a writer will, will write a script and, and, and lots of the content and the subtext is in their head, maybe, and not quite on the page or, and I think I've, I always have quite a sort of emotional and visceral reaction to a script. So I'll never give 10 pages of mm. notes. Um, it was always just, did this make me feel anything? Did this move me? Do I want to be here with these characters? Who am I interested in? Um, where did I lose interest? Where did it move me? Where did I want it to move me? And it didn't move me. So I always come at um, a script from that point of view first first and foremost and then I think just just building trust with a writer so they know that you've always got their best interests at heart really because it is all about the script yeah. you can't make a good show without a good script you just you just can't um so and I and I believe that the script and the editorial is the most important thing so it's just always always just trying to you know bring the best out of people really yeah it's it's really interesting that you bring up that kind of emotion. Um, it's a theme that has come up time and time again in these conversations that I'm having on the podcast, and it's always mm -hmm. something that I I think is is so important for for anyone in life, whether you're um, working on the on the script for a, a TV show or whether you're trying to get that next job. Is that sort of thinking about how you want the audience to feel and what that kind of yeah. emotional 
journey is for 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 your audience whether they're people sitting at home um, watching something on netflix or whether they're people sitting around that boardroom table as you're pitching for the for the podcast um yeah. that, that sort of same set of, of rules apply i think yeah i think so it's all about human um, it, connection, isn't it it is uh, and uh, and at that level where you create that bond of trust i think and it's interesting you've used that word in terms of the, the the writer needs to trust you but you need to trust the writer um and th that's about good working relationships and and having that kind of open and, and honest dialogue i suppose um i i have a very strong memory of uh walking into company pictures god we're talking over 20 years ago now um and walking into an audition and seeing you sat behind the table and going oh bloody hell we went to school together and, and we haven't been in touch for for a while there um i didn't get the part i'm not going to blame you for that um but you must have seen plenty of actors kind of come come through into those casting meetings and try and pitch themselves and, and get it really badly wrong um so like what it what's the biggest mistake that you see people making because i think that it's not just you know, actors that do this, people in, in all walks of life kind of make the same sort of mistakes. So, so what, what puts you off a pitch? Um, people need to be prepared, I think. And that's the same with anybody coming to me if I interview people, people that are prepared and that have done their homework and have really considered the material and it, it because it's amazing sometimes how, how many people don't <laughs> come in yeah, and, and no, absolutely. Not, yeah. not quite on it. Um, so, yeah, first and foremost, people that are on it, and you were. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and politeness um, goes a long way. Um, yeah. You'll always go further in life if you're a nice person, I think, because people will remember you mm -hmm. and, and maybe if you're not right for that role, you'll think, oh, that person, you know, let's bring them in for, for that instead. Um, what do they, what can people get wrong? Um, hmm. Actors, I think sometimes if they... If they're over, you can also be over prepared and have an idea in your head. And I think not listening, actually, it's really important yeah. to listen to the person who you're auditioning to or interviewing with, because there are people who can listen and take notes and adapt. And that's, that is, mm -hmm. you know, you need to do that, don't you? In all walks of life, you need to understand what Absolutely. it is that person wants. And some people that, that don't listen and um and therefore don't take notes and yeah you think that well that's not going to work <laughs> yeah <laughs> is do, do you find that you get a kind of instant feel i when i was a when i moved into directing like you you'd see people come into audition for you and you would mm -hmm. you genuinely think you were great but it just oh, it just doesn't feel right is it was is that the same in your experience absolutely yeah, with actors and with with all people, actually. Sometimes you just need it's it's sort of the it's a vibe. <laughs> it's hard to explain or to, yeah. to put into words, but yeah, yeah, it's an en an energy now, energy. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and and whether you think that that energy is going to fit into the yes. the kind of wider jigsaw, I suppose, as well, because. Yeah. You've, it's it's never just a, a one on one relationship. It's it's always one to mm. to many. Um, that sh that show that I was auditioning for was uh, was Inspector George Gently, which starred Martin Shaw, uh, and I think it ran for eight seasons, didn't it? Yes, Is that I think right? so. Yeah. Yes. So you you started as uh, I think a script editor. You became assistant producer, and you finally ended up as exec producer. So you you kind of seen that journey um of of the show but and like how did you how did you position yourself as you rose up through the ranks because you're presumably working with with people that 
also had worked on the show for a long time. So how did you grow into um, those new roles? Just just from being a like consistent person there, I think. So um, the writer that I was referring to earlier who, who um, inspired me when I was in Wallingford was Peter Flannery, who wrote Inspector George Gently. He's a wonderful man and writer, unmatched, really. He, um, I read, there were, I think, I think I read 46 Inspector George Gently books, um, <laughs> which the series is really based on. So I was there right from the inception. Um, yeah. and, and again, just, just having a relationship with, with Peter and the support of, of George, the exec, um, to yeah to work on the scripts to really it really was my training ground that show I I, I loved it yeah. I'm very fond of it and still very good friends now with Lee Ingleby who played Inspector Bacchus um so yes yeah. it was just be, just being there um and and knowing the show like I knew it inside out so um mm. yeah it's it a wonderful experience yeah did did you did you find that you know people took you under their wing and and sort of talk? I, I've always found television set, sets incredibly collegiate, and that people are really open and happy to to share. You know, right from the yeah. the grips and the set department through to hair and makeup. You know, ev everyone's willing to kind of give away their knowledge and and help you succeed. Was that yes. your experience too? Yeah. I had the most wonderful and lines. So, mm, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, go, 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 go for it. I was really lucky. I had a wonderful line producer. And I know that first time producers aren't always this lucky, but you really rely on them to kind of help you because they are, <laughs> they know the crews, they know the tricks that people pull. They, um, and she was very experienced, but a very kind person. Amanda Wazy is her name. Um, and and she really, um, she was wonderful and really helped me and enabled me. And there was no competitiveness. Um, she didn't want to be mm -hmm. a producer. She wasn't kind of um, um, competitive at all. Yeah, she was wonderful. So that really helps. And it's not always the case. And... Um, not everybody is generous in the industry, but I think when you just have to earn people's respect, don't you? Um, so mm. hopefully I did that and I was okay and had an amazing crew. In, in eight seasons, like every, everything can't have gone as smoothly as you, as you hoped it was. So were there, were there any moments like, you know, where, where things got behind or got off track where you thought, oh, are we ever going to get this back? <laughs> Honestly, I don't think so on that show. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. No. As a very well-oiled machine, Inspector George Gently, it was, was yeah. amazing. Um, I can't think... I think there was one day when maybe a crane fell over. Um, I mean, things do okay. happen. Of course, you have setbacks. Yes. Yeah. Um, but no, there were no big disasters. We were really fortunate. Yeah. I've had big disasters on other so shows. You... <laughs> <laughs> we can dig into those a little bit later on. Um, in, in terms of that kind of um, growth period, you've, you've referred to quite a few people by name who've sort of taken you under their wing or kind of mentored you through um, that process now now you're at the other end of the industry um like do, do you get people approaching you and 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 asking you for for help and uh, you know how, how what what do you recommend to people that are, are just starting out i yeah i do i try to i try to be as supportive as i can i get I get many emails a week asking for a cup of coffee and a chat and, and I, and I feel awful, but I can't meet all the people cause I just don't have the time. 
Um, but I did, I do mentorship. So I mentored um, a woman through the first series of Bad Sisters who was an assistant producer on the show. Um, and that was that was a really rewarding experience for me as well, actually, to... to um, mm. I say to me as well, I hope it was to her, but it, it was to, for me because... <laughs> <laughs> it just I think it's really important to give back because yeah I had so much help yeah. when I was was coming through and I think you have you have to do that and I'm really passionate about that and helping people whenever I can and giving people a chance um yeah it's important so I guess advice for people is always reach out because you never know you might just catch somebody at a time when they go actually I do have time to sit down with you or I I am looking for an assistant for a short period on this, so I'll give that person a chance or need a yeah. reader. So just get yourself out there, send those emails and and just, yeah, hope that you get the timing right. <laughs> it is in, in life so much is is actually about timing, isn't it? But I think you you mentioned earlier that idea of, you know, being prepared. And I think if you're yes. if you're prepared, then you you get those kind of opportunities to to seize the moment. Yeah. Um, it, as a as an exec producer, I presume that you're now kind of pitching at a different level. That you are, you know, having conversations with um, people that own rights to stuff, or, or talking to um, potential broadcasters about um, putting on your shows or broadcasting your shows. Um, how, how have your pitching skills developed over the last? 20 years and what what do you think is the most important elements of a of a good pitch I think the most important thing is to think about the person that you're pitching to and and really tailor what you're saying to that person because what channel mm. 4 wants and needs is very different to what ITV wants and needs and indeed Apple and the BBC um Everybody wants good stories and yeah. they want good good scripts, of course. But but there are I think um I've learned they, not to waste people's time. Um so know your know the the market, know who you're talking to. Know your audience. Their, their case. Yeah, exactly. Know your audience and don't um don't pitch ten things, actually. Pitch one the one thing that or two things that you're most passionate about that you genuinely think this would be great because because again i'm going to use that word trust they need to trust your taste and that you're not just flinging stuff at them that you that you've thought about it and that you think that's the right thing yeah um so that's i think yeah, that's I think how that... it's developed is to have the confidence to not not talk too much <laughs> do you get do you get nervous when you go into those big meetings very yeah and I talk too much. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do <laughs> is not to talk too much. Um, yeah, I do get, I do get nervous. Yeah. Um, but I uh, think that's a good I, I mean, thing. I, I'm, <laughs> I do as well. And I'm so glad that you've said that because I, I, I think it's, you know, it, all, all people, no matter how successful they are that I speak to, ha, have some level of imposter syndrome, ha, walk into those sorts of situations and, and kind of the voices in your head start to kick off. Um, yeah. And it's all about like managing that process, I suppose. Have you yes. got anything, you know, specific that you do to get you in the zone? I used to take rescue remedy actually <laughs> to sort of <laughs> a little bit. I haven't done that for a while. Um I I just do research. So I just want so if I'm if I'm going into the BBC, I will I will look at all the shows they've made recently, what you know, what trends, what what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them so well. It's just being prepared. Um and yeah. knowing the person that you're going to see, where they've been, who that yeah. you know, what their what their past and their history is, whether they come from an editorial background, whether they're sort of um <clears throat> haven't yeah, just be just be prepared. Always. Swat up. <laughs> I think there you go. 
Uh, it's a, a, a great piece of advice and something that is so easy to kind of overlook. I think so many people like to think that you can just wing it. Um, but in reality, you, you might. How... Sorry, I sorry to interrupt you. It's, there's a delay. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've interviewed people and and like they'll <laughs> like, you know, some some very experienced people and they'll make a disparaging comment about a show that I've produced or do you know <laughs> can you wow <laughs> um so yeah no like just do your homework guys hmm. It's it's so easy to do in in 2023 as well because you do, literally you can just go on Google or you can go you know in your case you can go on IMDb and you can see everything that you've done so yeah that's a a, a proper schoolboy error in that sense. Um, <laughs> you're now head of drama at Merman um, and yes. it seems to me from from the outside as a, as a very sort of special production company you know fem female led quite quite different within the industry um what 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 sort of energy does that bring to the the productions that you're um that are on the slate and the the kind of conversations that you're having i'm so lucky to be at merman i love it and i think because because i think we can say we're best in class at a certain type of show and we have a really strong identity yeah. as a production company um it just it's just nice to have that confidence because I've you know I've we've all been in our career sort of trying to find your place or your home or um and it's just wonderful to feel like I've found my tribe um and so it just brings yeah. a confidence which I think I think you can see Bad Sisters was just a labor of love for for Sharon and I and and Becky and Clelia um um my bosses yeah it's just um we're really passionate about the things that we make um we don't we don't churn stuff out i suppose um which yeah. is which is yeah. really nice it's boutique it's what we make is a labor of love um and i think that shows were you, you can see. were you involved in bad sisters right from the beginning yes yeah when i joined merman there was an episode one script um so right i was involved in setting up the writers room hiring the writers um yeah and then everything all the way through post to transmission yeah which is brilliant it's the best can you best experience. i can i can imagine it can you describe for for people what that you know process is like because in in life everything starts from something in someone's imagination and and i think a you know tv show is a is a great metaphor for that so you know someone has an idea and then yeah. 2 years later or 3 years later you're all standing on a stage holding a bafta um <laughs> and but there's a hell of a lot that goes on in the background to yes. to kind of get there so you know what what are some of the the important steps in in that journey and what were some of the challenges that you faced to to turn what you knew was a good idea into something that actually then became an award-winning show well it's all about Sharon really and her brilliant mind and her vision for the show and understanding that and being absolutely dogged in making sure that that gets onto screen because there is there is a long process. Lots of people read the scripts. Lots of people have thoughts, you know, lot, different directors, people coming onto set. And um, we were lucky that um, we had amazing um, bosses at Apple and ABC Studio who who supported Sharon's vision for the show. Because that doesn't always happen when you make a, a TV show sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bit of, you know, the director wants to go a certain way and the writer had imagined it slightly differently and you as a producer are trying to sort of stand in the middle and, and make the best of that situation. Um, but yeah. but Sharon's vision for the show, the tone of the show, I think is so important. And it's just making sure mm. that 
every level we delivered that in the casting in the music in the location the style the look of it and we had such talented people um directors everyone it was um we were lucky but they all came to the show because of how good the scripts were um so yeah again it all all comes down to the scripts but when you can assemble a crew that talented it's just about making sure that you enable them to to do the best work they can it's really interesting because often like episode ones are a little bit kind of hit and miss you know sometimes like you have to you have to mm -hmm. persevere with a show in order to get into it um but yeah. what's what what's brilliant about bad sisters is that you 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 kind of fall into that family's drama and tension and love like almost almost immediately now m for most people listening they they won't understand or you know probably haven't even really considered that the show's never shot exactly you know in in chronological order so think you know you you might start at the end of the episode and finish at the beginning um how, how do you how do you ensure that that creative vision does come to fruition when the parts aren't necessarily in the order that they end up in communication just really good communication and consistency so we were very lucky to have um Sharon and our um American execs Brett and Dave were often on set and it's just continuity so even yes you're shooting things out of, yeah. out of sequence but the director's incredibly prepared but the actors need to hold that tone and know what emotional sort of points they're hitting um, so yeah. again, being prepared, having people who've been through the whole process. So know that, um, this character's journey is going to go here. So you need to, to start showing that in episode two, you know, so that it can, mm -hmm. um, pay off in episode seven or, um, out so in episode yeah. five. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's just really, we were lucky that we had all 10 scripts before we started shooting, um, which was yeah. amazing and and Sharon on set every day um whether she was on camera or not really so that mm -hmm. I I think yeah having a writer around who knows who just knows the material inside out is invaluable yeah so and, I think that's how does, a, just how having, does a show yeah. like that how does a show like that change in the edit, like or grow in the edit, not change in the edit? But what you know, what's that kind of magic like? Yeah, there's a lot of playing around um, and finding sort of you know different devices um, stylistically to so you know putting the names on the screen or the uh, the flash yeah. forward flashback device just to kind of give Love it its own. Yeah yeah and putting you know like the prick on on screen and that that was it's in the <laughs> script, but it's just you know you kind of play around with it and it's just delivering that tone from the off I think there's a confidence to bad sisters in that it, it knows what it is from the beginning and that yeah I think the audience can feel that if they if they're watching a show that they that they feel the the program makers have made very confidently and know what it is I think it it helps your viewing experience because you can just relax into it and think, okay, they know what they're doing. I'm going to go along for the ride. Um, and that's yeah. all about the tone, I think. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, a, a really kind of slightly stupid and obvious question, but what what was it like to to actually win the the BAFTA for the show? I, I watched you go up on on stage with a massive grin on your face. Um, so yeah, ha how did it feel? And also what has that done for you and for Merman and for the show, um, you know, going forward? Um, it was amazing to win. Um, I, I didn't, we didn't expect to win, um, because, because of, <laughs> because of the tone of it, you know, when we were, um, 
I think people were like, is it a drama? Is it a comedy? It's very, we feel it's very much a drama with laughs, but sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, historically shows in the UK win prizes that are quite serious dramas. And so it was, even though this has really serious themes and subject matter, Mm. it's very entertaining. Um, So yeah, we were overjoyed to win, obviously. Um, And... um, and what's it done for Merman and us? I think just, you know, shown that, yes, Merman absolutely excelled at making half hour um, comedy dramas, but that we can produce something of that scale and um, and yeah. quality in a, in a different genre. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. So it's great for me as a drama producer to come to come to um the company and then the first drama we make winter BAFTA is it yeah it's great very good brilliant well very very much looking forward to seeing what uh what season two brings it's uh it's going to be an interesting uh way to to start a, a new series um so Faye, it's it's been fabulous talking to you and, and I, I could sit here and, and chat away all day, but I've got a final question um that I wanted to ask. As you as you think back to that um young woman standing in Wallingford pulling pints, if there's is there a piece of advice that you would give to yourself knowing what you know now? Mm-hmm. Yes, probably, probably not to worry so much, actually, and to kind of just back yourself, because I, as lots of people do, I'm sure tend to have a little negative voice person on my shoulder that, that I think is a very female thing that is like, am I good enough? Can I do this? Um, And it's just, yeah, just back yourself and have the confidence to to go for it, work hard and, and um, yeah, do your best and get rid Lovely. of that negative voice. Faye, thank you so <laughs> much for joining me on the show. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Why Life's a Pitch podcast. If you'd like to improve the way you pitch and communicate, I'm giving away a special gift to all my listeners. We've developed the Pitching with Impact scorecard to help you benchmark your pitch performance in six key areas. It will take you less than five minutes to complete and you'll receive a detailed personalized report packed full of insights and ideas to help you improve and grow. Just head over to dominiccolenso.com forward slash scorecard to get started.